Thanks. Uh, I want to thank Professor Yongnan Li and Professor Jimo Wang for invitation, support, and host. It's uh, my pleasure to speak here. So, so the work actually was motivated by two central problems in, in the Baoshan geometry of modular space of curves. One question is Fortin's conjecture, the other one is the effective cone of MG bar. So I want to fix genus of is bigger than or equal to two. And so everything is over complex number field. So I fix the partition of 2G minus two. That's new. So these entries MR is their positive numbers, their sum is 2G minus 2. And un un unordered, okay. Oh, maybe ordered or fixed them, okay, sorry. So I want to introduce a modular space of holomorphic one forms. So let's define this guy, H mu, BZ. Moduli space of holomorphic one forms. On uh, smooth stainless G curves. So more precisely what I mean, that means this guy parameterize the following objects. So it's a smooth genus G curve, okay? It's with my surface, along with a canonical divisor on this with my surface. Let's call it omega. And moreover, this canonical divisor has zeros exactly as the partition of mu. That means, if you look at the zero point of omega, you can write it as sigma mi pi i from one to k. So that means it has k zeros of multiplicity m1, m2, m2, mk. So once I fix the partition, I'll call this space h mu. So I mean, well, it's not very strange space. For instance, if you take a general partition 1, 1, 1, you just get an open set inside the heart bundle. Right. So we do know something about this space. Uh, so this guy actually. is a smooth complex manifold of dimension 2G minus 1 plus K. I mean, you can check the dimension because if the general par partition is 1, 1, 1, 1, it should be the dimension of the heart bundle over MG. Then if two points go together, make like uh, the partition more special, the dimension drops by one. You can check it easily. It has dimension two t minus one plus k. Okay. Are we assuming sets? Are we assuming the points are distinct? Yeah, they are distinct. Yeah. So it's an open. Uh, yeah, it's open. I'm not saying it's compact. It's open. Yeah. You're, you're ignoring. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Distinct points. You're also ignoring in the little Okay. Yeah, I'm, uh, yeah, let's not worry about that. Yeah. All right, so there is a local coordinate of this guy. So let's call the dimension this guy equals n. So there is a local m coordinate of this module space, I think introduced by Konservich. It's rather simple. Oops. 
So suppose you take a point parameterizing H mu, like a Riemann surface with a canonical divisor omega. Then first you can take a simplex basis, that's suppose gamma one, gamma two, up to gamma n. There are some some a closed loop in H one C Z such that sorry, here's a currency. Gamma one up to gamma 2G are the standard simplex basis. As you all learned in basic topology theory, topology course. So uh, the first 2G, I just take them to be the standard simplex basis. And the last several gamma are defined as, as following. So gamma 2G plus I is a path that connect the rather C with those mark point P1 something like P <coughs> PK not important. So this one defines a path that connects P1 and P PI for I from two up to K. Right. You choose an arbitrary path, some path to connect P1 and PR with no other points inside. So in concept, which I think he introduced the following coordinates. Because this is a psi, maps this guy C omega using integ integral of this conical divisor along those paths gamma i. as a point inside Cn. And if you write it as real and imagined part, that is R2n. Okay? He showed actually that gives you some local charts. Yeah, but what, sorry, what is gamma 2g plus 1? Uh, I don't work because I fixed p1, so I start from p2, p3, p4. So gamma 2g plus 1 is a path from p1 to p2. The so gamma 2g plus 3 is a path from p1. Ah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it just depends on your how to use the uh, indices, but I'm saying, yeah, basically I fix one point among them, I take the like, path connecting this point with the other points. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I mean, if you work them together, because I guess, well, I should, maybe I should do this. Let's do this, yeah. And then this guy. Right? Yeah, if you work out this, right? The last one, k minus one, it just gets 2g plus k minus one, that is it. I'm seeing dimension matrix, right? There's no issue. Right? And there are some special points with respect to this uh, local coordinates. For instance, there's a little lemma due to asking and a concave. Okay, so if, so the entries, roughly speaking, the entries of the point, say, omega under this local coordinate, <coughs> are all integers. In the sense, if I write Cn as R2n, okay, are all integers, if and only if, there exists a branched cover from your Riemann surface C to the standard torus E, which is this guy. Take the standard unit square, you could lose these two edges, could lose the other two edges, standard torus, it's a little curve. And let's call it F, we call it pi. Such that this conical divisor omega is the product of dz from this plane. Let me finish. Okay, just a few lines. And pi is only branched at some point, as a single point, 
Q in E, maybe Q is here, see? And the preimage of Q is given by the zero of the canonical divisor, just here. Sigma. Uh, I should, shouldn't say that, but uh, maybe I would say, and like it has ramification points over Q with ramification orders exactly given by those number M1, M2, up to Mk. Another word, so what, what is that here? Under these local coordinates, the entries of this guy are all integers, if and only if C admits a branch cover to the U standard torus, such as the pullback of the, the uh, one form DZ gives you this conical divisor omega. And this branch cover is rather special. It has only one branch point. Over this single branch point, there are only k ramification points, and their ramification data are determined by m1, m2, and mk. So let me just show uh, one line of the proof. What is the degree n cover? Oh, the degree d. Degree of the cover. Yeah, let me move like, oh, here. So the degree of pi is determined by the take omega that omega bar integral or your, your curve C maybe multiplied by negative one and square root over by two. This kind of thing. That determines the degree of the curve. I mean the, the proof is rather simple. Let me just show one direction. Suppose you want to do this direction. If you have all integer entries, how can you realize such a cover? You just do the following thing. You define the cover pi by pi maps the point P on E just by the integral of this canonical divisor omega along from, from say P1 to P. Then you mod Z plus Zi, mod the lattice. Because here I choose arbitrary paths. Why is it well defined? Just because of this condition. It only dif differ by some z linear combination of these things. But these things are all integers. So if you mod z plus zi is well defined, that means that gives you a map to the complex plane mod by z plus zi that gives you a map to the standard torus. So it's a rather simple lemma. All right? And the ramification of the humane, the map is located z goes to z to the end. Yes, that means that goes maybe omega, sorry, t goes to t to m one, m i plus one. Right, that means you have ramification order m one, m i, right? Local, yeah, because you pull back. Yeah. It also means that the genus of the term is Yeah, you genus is determined by mu, right? And, and fixed mu is a partition of two t minus two, so genus everything works out if you check it. So any other question? All right, so you see those covers are rather special. They behave like integer points in the modular space H mu. Okay. Right now we got like maybe a lot of covers. However, I mean you can vary the ellipse, the structure of the elliptic curve. Right here we take a standard torus. You can make it into arbitrary torus. Then we vary e. You get like a, a one-dimensional family of covers, like the J invariant of e. We consider such covers with a single branch point and the fixed ramification data. We just get like a one dimensional query space of covers. Let's call it T, D mu. So D determines the degree of those covers. Mu is a fixed partition of 2T minus 2.
So from now on, I will see those cover, those covers, they have a single branch point on some elliptic curve, and they have a fixed ramific ramification data determined by the partition mu. And the only thing you can vary is the complex structure of the elliptic curves. That's why you get a one-dimensional Hurry space of covers. So those those Hurry space of covers behave like a one-dimensional sub one-dimensional curve in, in H mu. Right. Is the space connected? Sorry, I did not is get your question. This space, this Hurry space, is connected. Uh, sometimes it is connected. Yeah, yeah. It depends on the monodon. Right? Yeah, yeah. There are even this space. It can have up to three connected components determined by conservation storage, I'll mention later. But anyway, there is something good for this space inside H mu. It's SL2R invariant, right? Because basically, if you apply SL2R action to the real part and the invariant part of your clinical device omega, somehow those covers are determined by varying the SL2R of this lattice. So this basically T D mu inside this module space is SL2R invariant. And one dimensional orbit. So this is good from a dynamical point of view. There is a special name for those curves, like for dynamical people. So those TD mu, actually they are so-called Tuck-Miller curves. I will not give a definition about Tuck-Miller curve because I wouldn't use any essential properties, just one. I'll mention later. But they are special from a dynamical point of view because of this SL2R invariant property inside the modular space of holomorphic one form. All right. I mean, there is a natural map because essentially this guy parameterizes those covers of elliptic curves, gives G covers of elliptic curves. So this guy maps to mg bar as a one dimensional subscheme, right? So you have the map H from T d mu to mg bar. I also abuse my notation. I also take the closure of this curve in the sense of admissible covers. Okay, I'll take the closure, denote. Because originally I only focus on smooth curves, but I love the curve to become nodal and the cover become nodal cover in the sense of admissible coverage. Yeah, I still denote the closure by the same notation, TD mu. It's not very important in the sense of admissible covers. Same maps to MT bar, blah, blah, blah. Okay. The so important theorem just proved last year by Mark Mullen. Well, essentially, Tuck-Miller curves are rigid; they do not move. So immediately, as a color, you get those special Tuck-Miller curves. They rather form like rigid curves in MG bar. We got tons of rigid curves in MG bar because you can vary your partition, vary your degree, whatever. So what's going on here? Because Intuitively, there's nothing you can perturb for such covers, right? You consider a cover of elliptic curve with one single branch point. What else can you vary? You can only vary the gene invariant, but we already did it. So it seems they, are, they should be rigid, and Mark Miller has proved that. Okay, let's switch to the special case now. Take a very special partition.
Which means maybe as a remark, there are infinite dynamics. So if it is curves in MG bar, you can start from genus 2. see, I'm going to talk about the interesting one is, well, the first interesting one is a special partition, let's take mu, is a total partition 2g minus 2. That means the canonical divisor has a single zero. Okay. And I mentioned conservation storage. They completely determine the connected component of H mu. They prove the connected component of H mu. And just for this special case, for this partition, I will only use this part. So this is a partition, okay? It has three connected components. Which is due due to which are due to hyperliptic odd and even spin structure. Roughly speaking, this part parameterized hyperliptic curves. You know the admit divisor current divisor in this form, right? This part you have a odd like a theta divisor from g minus 1 times p. This part, you have even theta divisor from g minus 1 times p. They are sort of invariant, so they are parity, so they distinguish the three kinetic components. They proved it. So I'll just focus on this one. And that means those curves, like one-dimensional Hurry spaces, maybe some parts are contained here, some parts contain in the other connected components. Now I'll just rather take those parts contained in the hyperliptic component. I'll use the following notation. Use T D mu plus 2G minus 2 and hype to denote the part of D mu in this component. In other words, it could have many components. I just take the part of those components inside the hyperliptic strata. That's okay, I still get a lot, because use the co local coordinates, I just started from point in the hybrid locus. I do the same thing, I get like part of the hurry space. I just take those parts. All right. All right. Now we get to hybrid curve. I guess you know what I'm going to do. It's actually this guy maps to the hybrid locus HT bar. We already saw it in the previous talk by David Hill inside MG bar. Right? Because. All right. So, as a simple corollary, we got tons of radius curves in this hybrid locus. So all this T D mu hype are rigid. <coughs> this is a locus of hybrid curves. Just because the image in MG bar are rigid because they are top mirror curves and of course it's rigid in a sub variety. But still you get infinite many. Here's a isomorphism between HT bar to a, another modular space. So it's isomorphic to the modular space of the zero curve with two G plus two unordered. Mark point, M0, 2G plus 2 tilde, 
which is a symmetric quotient of the modular space of J0 curves with 2G plus 2 ordered mark points. Okay? So this tells you here you get like infinite many rigid curves, and here is a finite map. Okay? You pull the rigid curve back to M0, 2G plus 2 bar, you get infinite many rigid curves there. Right? Because it's finite map. So let me just summarize for this moment. So what's the conclusion here? I mean, it's more than what we expected, actually. We got like those T, D, mu, hype, they are rigid. Um, HG bar, which is isomorphic to M0, 2G plus 2 tilde, and also, and their union, if you take all D, sorry, here's 2G minus 2, apologize. Actually, it's the risky dense. in the modular space. Why is it? Just because we start from some integer points. Upstairs here, if you are integer points, so here if you are dense, you map down, you also get dense. Here is dominant. So that's pretty an intuitive explanation. In other words, they are not containing any divisors in H bar. Genus goes up with degree very high, I mean, it's like basically it behaves like a polynomial of degree. Sure. I mean, could, you, could you not make this go through with some other partitions or there any reason you have to choose? Because other partitions you may not be able to map to HG bar. I will use other partitions for attacking the effect two of MG bar. That's the second application. But now I want to focus on this part. I said it's motivated by two questions. I'm just addressing the first one. Right, so here's yeah, the next, next, next thing I want to show you. Let's get back to the motivation, so I have conjecture. So basically you know the statement, so I would rather say this guy, uh, with our ordered points, it's more with cone of curves, or conjecturally generated by vital curves. And Kion McKernan showed so I mean we don't know whether it is true for general N, but Kion McKernan showed if there is some Hypothetical counterexample. A potential example. A photon's conjecture must be a rigid curve. Actually, which is not in the boundary. That means which contains like some smooth curves, not only those boundary part, boundary of the modular space. So when you want to disprove for this conjecture, you should look at rigid curves. I think like people found a few rigid curves, but only for limited n, maybe for n 12, 8. But here I'm telling you there are tons of Rigid curve, infinite many, there are more than you expected. So, of course, the question is whether there are counter examples. Right, that's your question. So, you mentioned some previous examples of rigid curves. Are they of this type? 
Uh, they are more defined from a dynamical point of view. They're using Hilbert modular surfaces I'm not going to address, but they are similar. Right? You have to make those SL2R invariant orbits in the maybe tag mirror space. That's the original definition of, of tag mirror curve, one definition. Yeah. But these are rather special. Okay, we want to study this intersection with boundaries, uh, which can help us determine whether they are quantum examples or not. Actually, you can show the following thing. This curve behaves special, but unfortunately, or fortunately, up to your attitude. They are not quantum examples, but they are still special. I'll show their specialty. So the next conclusion is just a simple proposition. So for any D, okay, they all span the same extreme array of the cone. It's not the cone of curve, but the cone of moving curves is rather surprising because they are rigid curves. Or maybe the closure of the curve of moving curves, but in this, this case it's okay, I think. Um, see, M0, 2G plus 2 tilde. So cone of moving curve basically <coughs> takes the curve which deforms whose definition covers the whole space and put them together from their numerical classes from a cone take closure to cancel. I'm sorry? Exactly, the only model class I only have one curve, even I have infinite many. The proof is very simple. You just show because still by Q and Macronan. You show that this guy is effective cone of dividers is rather, rather simple. The effective cone. It's just generated by boundaries, right? There's no other issue. So di is a divisor like this, p1, p1, with i mark points, with 2t plus 2 minus i mark points on the other component, I think. Yeah. Well, then you study what kind of singular curves that can appear in those Tagmuller curves. Then basically it tells you the intersecting numbers, right? So actually you just analyze, eventually I can show this guy does not meet any boundary except the first one. Or the intersecting numbers for any i is bigger than two. In other words, it only has the biggest boundary components D2. That is a rather explicit analysis for admissible covers. So that basically gives the proof by using the duality between the cone of moving curves and the effective cone of divisors. I think I, I can try, but my intuition is those may not be counterexamples of F contracts that might disappoint you. And there are some intuition, but I'm not worried about that at this stage. Right. Uh, maybe I, I think I understand your question. Uh, I think the question is between the hyperliptic locus and this alone that can fall. This part? Yes, maybe I'm wrong, but I don't think that the branch locus uniquely the complex structure of the corner. Up to monogamy. I mean, if you have two difference, the composition of the of the unit in S uh, to Q plus two. I'm 
I mean, the automorphism is rather ex explicit. It's a double cover. It's a double cover. It's a So did, yes. so did it answer your question? No, no, sorry. No, yeah, did it answer? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> Remark. Well, these are rigid curves, but they span the extreme area of the core moving curves. What's this really? This really actually is very simple. You just take the following thing. Take C to be a one dimensional family. Fix a P1. You fix up those like, uh, mark points. You just move one of the mark points. Okay? So this guy only hits boundary D2. Again, this guy is always 0. For oh, okay. But it only has his D2. So basically, that means C and, but C now is moving because C covers a general point in the module space. Now every point, like P1 with 2G plus two points, I can do this kind of thing. So C is moving on the module space. So that tells you C and, so this ray is rather spanned by. Both a moving curve and a rigid curve. So this is uh, something. When I first thought about it, I got like very confused. But anyway, that's life. I'm sorry. Yeah, this is a boundary. But I'm saying this guy is really moving, right? I mean, I'm not saying this guy is like the closure is really inside, right? I mean, it's moving, right? Yeah. Right, so I said, so this, well, I mean, this could, could not be a counterexample. Otherwise, F counter would be too simple. So unfortunately, they are not counterexample. You guys should work harder. Let me switch to the second application. So, effective form of empty bar. <laughs> well, for they are not only rigid curve. I, I have others that I did not tell you. <laughs> right, anyway, let's back to a partition more general M1, M2, Mk is a partition of 2D minus 2. So I want to give a combinatorial description of those covers parameterized in the Tuck-Miller curves. So we can easier to study their geometric structures. So there is an old idea, actually as pointed out, which dates back to Hurwitz. So we fix the towers, the related curve E. Okay. We have A, A, B, B, the simplex basis. And you have a unique branch point, and around it we choose a loop, let's call it C. So in the fundamental group of this puncture torus, you have the conjugator A, B, A inverse, B inverse, E cos C, right? Now how do you associate cover using the monodrum images? Basically, you go along the loop A, suppose if upstairs you have a dish cover, you will get a permutation class in SD. And similarly, if you go along the other loops, you'll have different permutation classes in the symmetric group SD. But they have to satisfy this condition. And especially this loop is going to be special because that's a loop around the branch point. So that permutation class should with respect to this structure new. So that's basically give you the idea how to describe a cover using like their monodrome images in symmetric group. So let me define the fo following cover set. Curve D mu. So I look at their monodromy images in the symmetric group SD. So consider two pairs, let's call it alpha beta inside the symmetric, the permutation group SD. So they are just two elements, like a permutation on D letters. They satisfy the following condition. So alpha beta, alpha inverse, beta inverse should be 
in the controversy class in the following form determined by mu because this is the monotremic image of this loop C around the branch point. So I will write down this notation. I say m1 plus 1, m2 plus 1, up to mk plus 1, then 1, 1, 1. Which means this is a controversy class consisting of cycles of length just m1 plus 1, m2 plus 1, da da da. So the, the inside number just determines the number of uh, the length of the cycle. Let me give you an example before you ask me. So suppose we have seven letters, a1, a2, a3, a4, and say a5, a6, a7. That means a1 sends to a2, a2 sends to a1, a3 sends to a4, a4 sends to a3, a5 sends to a6, sends to a7, then goes back to a5. In this notation, it, it, is contained in the following conjugacy class. This is a cycle of length 2. This is a cycle of length 2. This is a cycle of length 3. So basically that means around the uh, ramification point corresponding to this cycle locally it maps like z maps to z square. So here is z maps to z to the third. So you want to get those ramification order m1, m2, you have to make them into z m i plus 1. That's exactly what I meant. I hope it's clear enough. But these are not sufficient for determining a cover because I want some more. I want, uh, okay. So moreover, I want the subgroup generated by the two conjugacy classes. This is subgroup in SD. I want its transitive acting on the D letters. This means guarantees the covers I get will be connected. Because otherwise you might get upstairs like a DCC cover, but the curve is disconnected just because those D letters may not be sent to each other by alpha or beta. But now if you impose this transitivity condition, that means that these sheets must be sent to each other. That means you get kinetic covers, right? Of course, I have to describe isomorphism between covers, right? So I want to define the uh, equivalence relation between two different pairs. So I define alpha beta is one pair is equivalent to another pair alpha prime beta prime if and only if there exists some element tau inside the symmetric group SD such that the conjugate action by tau. That means tau alpha, tau inverse, tau beta, tau inverse equals alpha prime beta prime. So this means the action of tau amounts to relabeling the dishes. Of the cover. Because there is no canonical way to associate the letters to the covers. So they're going to be different by now conjugate action. If I mod this conjugate action, I'm OK. I'm just up to isomorphism. I get covered. So all of this just tells you, if you believe me, so the, if you find a fixed E, fixed elliptic curve E, like those covers with the ramification data mu, Actually, they are finding many up to isomorphism. And it's going to be parameterized by the covering set, of D mu, modulo the equivalence relation. Up to isomorphism, so such like non-isomorphic covers. In particular, the number of those covers, such covers, is just a cardinality of this set, modulo the equivalence relation. Let's denote this number by n d mu. It's a positive integer. It's an integer, so well, it just denotes the number of non-isomorphic covers. I'm saying as long as you can count the cardinality of that set, you can get the number of different covers.
Let me walk here. No, let's see an example. Yeah, I don't have enough time, but let's, let's still do an example. Consider a degree 5, just genus is 2, and the position mu is the total position of 2g minus 2 is 2. Let's do this. Okay. So because you are in S5, so the conjugacy class corresponds to each entry is in mu plus by 1, and in together you get 5. So you want some conjugacy class corresponding to the ramification data should be something like 3, 1, 1. That cons consists of a cycle of length 3. Basically, z maps to this through a third. Then you get the ramification point of order 2. The other one are unramified. So these are five points under over the unique branch point. So this is of multiplication city 3, 1, 1. So in total, you get degree 5. Okay? So let's take a pair alpha and beta. So I'm going to take alpha since 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 2, 2, 3, 4, 1, 5. Okay? 1, 2, 2, 2, 2, 3, 3, 2, 4, 4, 2, 1, 5, 2, 5. Beta is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 2, 5, 2, 3, 4, 1. So beta are fixed, 2, 3, 5. And switch 1, 5. So you check the commutator alpha, beta, alpha, inverse. Beta inverse is in this conjugacy class. You just do an elementary calculation. So how do you realize such a cover? I'll draw the picture. Suppose here is your standard torus, is a square, just a unit square, right? This is E. I want to glue a cover using five unit squares, right? It's degree five cover. I can do it rather explicitly. So C is something like this. I can label them, this one, two, three, four, five. It's an octagon. I have eight vertices. I have to glue some edges together to make it a Riemann surface. How do I glue? So these are not vertices, OK? These are one edge. Right. So I do have eight vertices. I glue these two edges together, glue these two together, glue these two together and glue these long edges together. Okay. Then how do I check? Suppose alpha is a horizontal loop, beta is a vertical loop. Then along horizontal, you see one goes to two, two goes to three, three goes to four. Because I glue these two together, four goes back to one. And five goes to five. Similarly, you check beta. So that's just very explicit. That's why from a dynamical point of view, people call such covers, they call the square tailed surfaces. Riemann surfaces, in other sense. Because they are covered by unit squares. Okay. So I'll keep changing the notation. I'll call covers or square tailed surfaces, they are the same thing. Depends on whether you treat them as real edge curves or Riemann surfaces. Now I want to study, I have those Tuck Miller curves, T D mu, maps to MG bar. Of course, you still want to study the intersection with boundaries and lambda to see what conclusion you can draw. So for instance, suppose you want to study the intersection number with boundary delta, total boundary delta. So you have to study how the smooth cover degenerate to single singular covers. And the thing is, downstairs, uh, elliptic curve, this guy degenerates to the Russian middle curve. Suppose this loop is a local vanishing loop. Local, local vanishing cycle goes to a node, something like this. This guy goes to a node. So you look at this picture, just like a <laughs> intuitively speaking, that means this cylinder shrinks to form something like this. You form a node here. 
and the top one also shrinks because the local one cycle is assumed is corresponding to alpha, it's horizontal, something like this. You will get a nodal cover, which has two nodes. That's basically the intuition how you count the intersection with boundary divisors. So in other words, you see, it really depends on these like two special horizontal cylinders. Sorry, I should draw those. This is one that gives you one node. The other one is the bottom one, which is longer. So when the horizontal loop corresponding to the vanishing cycle goes to a node, those cylinders shrinks to node. So let me define another number, we call it n. n d mu to be the total number of those horizontal cylinders. I won't define them, but I hope you get a sense from the picture. On um, those are uh, all square pair surfaces. Parameterized in like this cover set called D mu mod equivalence relation. Okay. All right. So also define the slope of this Takamura curve to be the quotient as usual. T D mu. You see, image dot total boundary delta over the intersection with the first chain class of the hot bound or lambda. So people like to study those slopes. I'll mention a reason later. So I'll present the theorem which computes the slope in, term, in terms of these numbers m and the number n I defined before. Oh, I still have n here. Okay. So this denotes the total number of non-isomorphic maps. Basically, the cardinality of curve mod equivalence relation. So this part actually was done quite long ago in my thesis. The slope is a rather messy formula. So it's in this way. Calf over 1 plus n d mu over m d mu times some constant determined by genus and the partition. Okay. So mu is a partition m1 up to mk. And n is the total number of non-isomorphic covers. m is the counting of the number of horizontal cylinders on those covers. You take the quotient, plug them in, you get slope. Okay. So why is it, well, I mean, what can we do with this uh, like rather abstract formula? It contains so many unknown things. It was bothered me for three years, until recently I got well, I mean, got some help from dynamical people. I think roughly I can analyze the asymptotic behavior of this curve. Because we rather want to know what happens when degree is large or distance is large, the asymptotic behavior of those covers, because that's going to give you infinite many examples. Well, I mean, the motivation is the following. So you suppose you have a divisor on uh, MG bar. OK? So well, I can show when k is bigger than c minus 1, actually, the union of those type Miller curves is still, if you take d to infinity, it's still dense, the risky dense in MG bar. 
In particular, that tells you D dot infinite values of TD mu going to be non-active. As that tells you just for infinity many D. Because if D contains all of them, then D has to contain empty bars as a contradiction because their union is risky dense. So just because this simple fact, because of this simple fact, you get the slope of D, which is defined by the coefficient of lambda and the minimal coefficient of delta is bigger or equal to the limit of the slopes of those tangential curves, if the limit exists. So roughly, that's another reason why we want to analyze the limiting behavior of the slopes of those type of curves. So as I said recently, well, there's uh, some little lemma plus expectation let me write down. Due to asking and asking storage. I think they have some reasons and they obtained very strong numerical evidence and they told me they should prove things in the future. However, they study rather different things. They are counting Lyapunov of exponents and sigma of each constant from totally different point of view. But somehow it eventually relates to this slope calculation, just relates to this quotient. Because it has a meaning. It's counting those cylinders on the flat surfaces. So eventually what I'm going to draw just the final line of their expectations. They expect basically this number should go to a half. But only for non hyperliptic strata. Because I told you some tangential curves are contained in the hyperliptic strata. I don't want to consider them. That's for the others, all of the others, for non hyperliptic strata. Okay. So let's believe that for this moment, then plug this number a half here. Then basically you will see here it gets constant. This part rather is just determined by the fixed partition. It's still this guy grows like a O like one over G, unfortunately. So basically it tells you the limit of those tuck neural curves. Grows like some constant times 1 over g. So that's a rather long question which bothers many people, I guess including Ian Morris and myself here. I uh, bothered you for 20 years. I hope it will not bother me for another 20 years. So let's see. <laughs> 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 All right. So what's going on here? So why we are so unhappy if we get like something that goes like one over G? Because you let me just use another five minutes to finish the talk. So the question is, people are trying to study, like suppose you have effect devices in this form. And these are positive numbers, A, B, I. This effect device are MG bar. And we define the slope to be a over the minimum of those coefficient b i. And on the one hand, so all known divisors, the all known divisor, has slope bigger than 6. On the other hand, of course you would expect, okay, since we really tried hard, we did not get any divisor with slope smaller than 6, so maybe 6 is a lower bound for SD. So the lower bound is all known lower bound for the slope SD for all D on G bar. Grows essentially like this G, like what I wrote down on the board. Some coefficients constant times 1 over G. For G large. So that means for large G, there is a huge gap between 6 and 1 over G. So it's like kind of embarrassing you haven't seen any evidence like for which we should believe more. Okay? 
But let me give my two cents here. You can get the density of those Tuck Miller curves. Otherwise, those Tuck Miller curves might map into the sub variety of MG bar. So I want to consider under this condition, which mu maximize the right hand side so I get better lower bound. So it's not hard. You just try the so mu as following. I choose 1, 1, 1, g. So here you have g minus 2 entries of 1. Total sum is 2g minus 2. And you have g minus 1 entries. So that's a critical value for k. So for this guy, it maximizes. I might be wrong. It's an elementary calculation. But anyway, so as t d mu, the limit got maximized to grow like with g, like this number. This number must be familiar to at least one person in the audience because it's number obtained by Ian Morris and Joe Harris like 20 years ago. By a similar but still different method. Let's see, Harris and Morrison. Six study ZDZ. ZDG is a degree D covers, or genus G covers, of P1. So we are studying elliptic curves. Their study covers a P1 with a moving branch point, because then you can cook up one-dimensional family. So if you fix P1, you fix those branch points, you just move out of them. Then you get a one-dimensional family of curvy space of covers of P1. And similarly, this guy maps to MG bar, you can compute the slope. And the benefit is here, if D is large enough, this guy becomes moving curves on MG bar. So essentially for D, I think it's maybe D greater or equal to G plus 1 divided by 2 something. Don't really remember, but for D large enough, those guys become moving curve. So we got rigid curve, they got moving curve. Okay? And then the question still boils down to a massive formula like this. But again, they got some heuristic argument which shows the best slope, the best lower bound they can get to the best of S Z D G for some possible D and large G grows like yeah, grows. the same number as I go down. But this is not a rigorous argument as my understanding is just a heuristic argument. Okay? Am I right? Yeah. Okay. So what's going on here? So we got like still the same phenomenon, like some rigid curves and some moving curves. If you see only for large G, they have the same behavior. So let me tell you, like my guess, I mean it could be very wrong, but anyway. Let me make my opinion here. At the end of the talk. So just suppose we fix G large enough, okay? We still consider the cone of moving curves. And consider the limit of those Tuck Miller curves and also those CDG for large G. That means they're gonna spin some ray very close to each other in the cone of maybe close to I mean in the cone of moving curves because this guy is really moving. C D G, right? So here's a Maybe here's a moving cone. The cone of moving curve. We have seen this picture for the hyperlip locus. So here's some ZDG. Here's a Tuck Miller curve, ZD mu. Well, I mean, just for that example we saw before, for M0, 2G plus 2 tilde, this common ray, suppose there is some common ray that's commonly going to be extremal. So here, believe it or not, if you believe this is a huge if, if you believe, so similar things happen for MG bar. So this common ray, let's call it R, is essentially an extremal ray of the cone of moving curves. Then we are done. Basically, we are done. So 
So then what happens, that means by the duality between moving cone and cone of effect curves, it means there are going to be a phase of the cone of effect divisors that's considered as like D and some delta, delta 1, delta 2 up to delta G over 2. And the reason I wrote this boundary divisor is just because these do not meet the tuck middle curve I can show. The only tuck middle curve only meet delta naught. Essentially, only the coefficients of delta naught are dominant. So this is going to be dual to R, which tells you R dot D is zero, which tells you the slope of D so exists on D. Should be the same as slope of R, which is close to, because R is close to these two things, close to 5, 7, 6 over 5T. So the only thing, trust it or, or not, you take your own risk, is this, this belief. Anyway, I think I seriously run out of time. Let me stop here.